know, in these days of Afrofuturism, Afro pessimism, all the isms <laughs> that start with Afro and end in isms, it, <laughs> it, it really, you, we really do have to question what is being sold, what is being presented, and what uh, it has to do really with Pan Africanism. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I haven't necessarily um, beyond that thought how how best we can do it, but I definitely agree with this with the statement because I just think that in this day when in fact yes I do have something to say <laughs> in fact in these days when so much to do with the cultural sphere and work and skills within the cultural sphere have come down to marketing come down to presenting things in a commercial context where you can um, uh, possibly uh, earn some money from it or you can present it in such a way so that you can earn some revenue to keep it going, which is, you know, uh, you, know you do need uh, revenue for a lot of activity in this field, so that's relevant. But so many young people now and so many people who are coming to the sector are coming to it without sufficient knowledge or background or even desire to know more or to understand more. And I think, to me, that's how I see that term because I see that sometimes happening, mm -hmm. that there isn't any real understanding of what Pan-Africanism is, Pan is and how it manifests or should be. You know, we've been talking about um, uh, culture, Pan-African culture, mm -hmm. being something that is is um, performed and it's lived and relived, mm -hmm. and um, and it's in in the course of it being created that creativity comes about, and I think so much now is happening through propaganda for other purposes. Mm -hmm. So I, I definitely agree with with that term, I suppose. I'd like to address the uh, notion of desire. <laughs> is that such a juicy word? <laughs> it is. And so what is it that, that we want? And when I think of, I never thought about Pan-Africanism with the small p mm -hmm. as opposed to the big p, but I think that there's a lot of feelings of, of desire to reconnect among people. You know, we're all connected. Um, reconnect to your family, to your generations and relatives across the waters and across, you know, around the globe. And what are the things that we do in order to affect that reconnection? And so when I think of desire, um, when, when I went to Nigeria, and it was the first time out of the country, um, when I, and I look at my photographs, we were just like looking in each other's eyes and it was just this, you know, wanting to know each other and we weren't thinking of ourselves as Pan-Africanists with a capital P, but we just mm. really wanted to know engage. who engage with each other and just like stare at each other and talk to each other. <laughs> and so um, when I think about what June said, the marketing part, uh, how do we turn, I mean, we're in a capitalist system, so, and we've collected this stuff, it, it takes effort, money, whatever, to keep an archive going for so, so, so many years. How do we turn this into what uh, Kim uh, Williams talked about, a cultural industry? How do we get paid for what we, we've really provided a service to the world, right? Yeah. You know? <laughs> so what do we do with that, and how do we, uh, use that desire, you know, knowing that everyone's got that desire, you know, that want and that need, how do we get that to them in a way that helps us to pay our rent? Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I, I, I was thinking the desire in the, in the sense of when you read, for instance, all the books written by uh, Sheikh Antadiop, it's mm -hmm. a kind of desire of trying to uh, Reestablish mm -hmm. the truth about uh, African mm -hmm. uh, civilization. <coughs> the same desire we have um, doesn't need to become a kind of paranoia in mm -hmm. the sense uh, 
um, Africa need also to take something somewhere. Mm -hmm. It can be mm -hmm. maybe in African American culture, mm -hmm. in West Indies culture. It's not only to go back to uh, what we did face when we were like in the slavery, because the the Pan Africanism is also an idea which came from the fact that we were in the situation of the slavery once we were relieved or we, we did ourselves to be relieved of that, we tried to seek what kind of uh, idea could make us be together in order to create something which is big mm -hmm. so that when we're going to express our point of view, we're not going to be uh, like dominated by the same people who put us in the same uh, situation. So the desire, which can be maybe a title of a book, the desire of, um, of uh, the Pan-Africanism is far, for instance, from what I've been reading um, about uh, uh, a few thinkers trying like to spread the anger because they need to define Africa by like excluding people. I can like talk with my enemy. I can talk with someone who was like uh, anti-Africa. It's my task to uh, explain to that guy that you don't understand what is taking part here. We came far from what you are witnessing here. We struggled, we fought for our civil rights here. We, we've been killed, mm -hmm. compared to Malcolm X, uh, uh, James Baldwin, who wrote a lot of, a lot of pieces about uh, the Congress, I think mm -hmm. that uh, I've been seeing here. But the desire mm -hmm. is also the um, idea of putting all our all knowledges we have in the table so that people can just see how we can express mm -hmm. our world throughout the arts, throughout the science, throughout the anthropology and so on and so on. But that is still to be done, mm -hmm. mainly in the youth in Africa. Mm -hmm. where they are like uh, being uh, embraced by the other culture, by the fact that African culture is nothing. So we need like to change mm -hmm. our clothes in mm -hmm. order to look like the modernity wants the new African to appear. I think it was more basic than that. I don't, I, in my experience, we mm -hmm. weren't even intellectualizing that much, we were just like wanted to be there in each mm -hmm. other's presence. <laughs> and I think that it was just really that basic. Mm -hmm. Thanks. I'm really struck actually by the fact that both youth and um, mm -hmm. uh, needing to make a living come up because uh, <laughs> I know it, one of the things that really interested me in the proceedings from the 1966 um, colloque, uh, uh, Catherine Dunham was there and in her presentation, mm -hmm. she said, you know, this is great, all of this, uh, you know, talk and performance, but we also need to think about mm -hmm. how are our mm -hmm. artists going to afford to be educated mm -hmm. and to have mm -hmm. somewhere to, to perform and, and bring mm -hmm. their art to the table. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to ask about uh, um, the traditions of kind of art-specific festivals alongside um, the kind of pan arts that have been parts of the, the, the cultural festivals that mostly we've talked about. Um, and I want to thank you, June, for bringing the Carthage Festival into our conversation. It's, it's kind of bizarre that that falls out of our lineage oftentimes in terms of how we talk about um, the um, series of festivals and, and the fact that it's still going after all this time. But then also, I'm struck, I had been thinking about writing festivals as something that were, was 
we're really coming to the fore, um, the Ake Festival in Lagos, um, Rightivism in East Africa and so forth, but the conversations here have reminded me that the Congress of Black Writers and Artists um, in 56, you mm -hmm. know, like the, it's almost a kind of return of that in our present moment. So I wonder if you have thoughts on um, kind of medium specific festivals in their relation to um, these kind of multimedia festivals. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, it's a, it's a curious Quite thing. Good. It's a curious question, but also um, what is a curious thing is the fact that there are now so many, so many African film festivals around the world. So many. When you go to Ouagadougou, sometimes there's a dinner one evening and the whole long table are curators from Tokyo, Warsaw Film Festival, three or four from Italy. Not only Milan and Venice and those, but small areas like uh, uh, Verona, uh, um, a small part of Verona has its own African film festival. There are so many, and I don't know, I don't know if we can say necessarily that they're propaganda because people seem to be in, in that context, mm. definitely very interested. And in the absence of proper distribution mm -hmm. for African cinema, these festivals actually play a role in the economy of mm -hmm. supporting um, African cinema because um, they're festivals that pay a rental. And because we've now moved beyond 35 millimeter and 16 millimeter films, which actually the celluloid would, would you know, deteriorate so you're in a digital age where it can be shown uh, more and more with less consequences for deterioration. So um, I don't know, I'm a slightly ambivalent. I'm glad that some of them exist, and especially when they exist and they take African cinema seriously and they present it seriously. And as I think that they also provide this opportunity for some sort of economy. It's a, a level of, of creating the, the economy for this. So I think that is, is uh, it's, it's quite important. But I think also what they do, the specific, um, and although they're specific, um, um, sorry, um, not genres, what's the word? <laughs> specific arts, uh, festivals, very often, the, I mean, especially cinema, you've chosen, we've chosen the wrong one because cinema in itself is a combination of all those different art forms. And what they have um, at FESPACO often are discussions between writers. I mean, very, very often there have been big discussions between, and there's always a forum for writers because at one time African cinema was suffering very much from not having really good writers mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. in uh, and you know the filmmakers learnt the the art of mm -hmm. of um, of filmmaking, but everybody wanted to be an auteur, mm -hmm. so they were writing their own films and they didn't have the writing their own scripts and they didn't necessarily have that skill. Mm -hmm. And so at one time, uh, Fe Passi, the Pan African Filmmakers Federation, set up um, one of their big forums between. Mm -hmm. Uh, the African Writers uh, Organization, I can't remember which one it was, and African filmmakers, so that there would be this collaboration mm -hmm. of skills and they would be working more closely together. Mm -hmm. So I think um, definitely around mm -hmm. cinema, it's still necessary for that, for that combination. Um, I think that's, that's what I have to say. I think you, you're right, you're right. When I was talking about propaganda, it was to distinguish between uh, the activism and what is like uh, the art, in which, you know, the, for the, the colloquium in uh, 56 and 66, it was the meeting of uh, the black world. So, uh, you will see like uh, James Baldwin 
is like writing about that Congress for the Review Zero and is trying to explain why Senghor and Césaire are uh, talking in France, whereas they have languages. It's very important to see how the writers or the thinkers are trying to describe the process of creation, how to deal with the situation with, in which you have to write in the language, which is not uh, like uh, the language of the Pan-Africanism. If you have to pick a language, you're going to take like Swahili, Lingala, uh, and so on and so on. But the fact that uh, I think that you talk about the mental colonization, colonization here, that the problem of the activism, they need like to force people to see the world in one sense and they don't want to understand that uh, you can be in the Pan-Africanism but you can have also, you can part your way in the way of uh, presenting uh, the, the, the topics, cinema, literature, music and so, express the real desire of that kind of Africa in which people are creating but at the same time, if you take like the activists who are really the politicians and they want to become politicians and when they become politicians, they're going to be dictators. <laughs> Usually, yeah, you know. I mean, um, uh, what uh, uh, name um, the president of uh, uh, Guinea at that time uh, was Sekouture came like uh, pretending to be a Pan-Africanist. We know how ended uh, the Guinea. He was one of the uh, greatest uh, dictators in Africa. So uh, I was just trying to uh, separate the, this bad activism from the real work done like by Semben Osman, uh, Medondo, we saw here uh, from that propaganda coming from the activists. You have, you still have like uh, nowadays, people saying, I'm gonna go back in Africa in order to fight and they go over there. They are fighting, but they are like driving Mercedes, uh, doing everything while the people are suffering. So I don't know what kind of Africa you they need like to share with the Africans over there. Thank you. I'm reminded of a couple of things we've heard in the, the keynotes. One, that yesterday Bashir uh, saying that uh, negritude was always a negritude to come. Yes. Um, and I think that really resonates with uh, what uh, John Acompra that we saw in that one moment was talking about in terms of these moments where optimism seems to mm -hmm. almost erupt, uh, other moments where it seems to dissipate um, and that perhaps we're in, uh, or at least at festivals, there's sometimes this palpable optimism mm -hmm. that maybe mm -hmm. kind of reignites some of that uh, mm -hmm. sense of a desire that um, isn't met in the moment, but that kind of ignites uh, this hunger for something more. Mm -hmm. I think the, the context of that talk, he was giving a talk at the Image Karib Film Festival in Martinique, and his paper was about Caribbean identity. And the thing about Caribbean identity, and it was a festival where black British directors of Caribbean origin were also present. And of course, you know, Stuart being based in the UK, has been one of the people that has been theorizing around the work of black British directors um, and the development of black cinema in the UK and the aesthetics and those sort of issues. And so I think for maybe it was in reference to that sort of double migration because a number of us, um, uh, of course we have histories in the Caribbean mm -hmm. where I was actually born in the Caribbean. Some of the younger filmmakers were born in England, but their parents would have come from the Caribbean. And so there's already been, in our generation, a double migration. Um, uh, well, treble, if you take into account their original sources of their ancestry, mm -hmm. which would have been the African continent. In the case of Guyana, where's my friend from Guyana? In the case of Guyana, from the African continent, from the Indian continent, and from Europe, and from China, in fact. 
um, and then the, the of Caribbean identity. But then those in the 50s and the post-war years, a lot of those people moved again. And um, I'm not sure, and I think it was possibly in relation to exploring that. I'm not sure, and I can't um, make the case for how that, that continual migration happens in a pan-African sense mm -hmm. for the whole of the, you know, of everybody from the African continent. But it would be interesting also to hear how African Americans see that, that, that question of a continual migration. I'm not sure how the audiences were generated in Festac 77, uh, but the opening ceremony had like thousands and thousands of people who at, at some point it seemed that the, uh, and when you think of Festac, one has to think of in terms of scale, uh, what we know as the Olympics. There, you know, there was a Festac village, like there was an Olympic village, there were stadiums, there were opening ceremonies, uh, ceremony, closing ceremony, and events within, um, between the opening and closing. And there were people who were really excited to see, especially the Americans, but everyone who, uh, who paraded through the opening ceremony. Um, they were especially uh, looking forward to seeing the, the liberated, the, the, the country, this was before, um, you know, the, the, there was a representation from um, some of the countries in Southern Africa who were still fighting the liberation zone. So there, w there was a sense, there was a general sense of, of camaraderie, or I don't, camaraderie may not be the, the right word, but of, of togetherness between those who were uh, formerly part of the um, festival and those who were witnessing um, f the festival. Um, I particularly think about audience, um, uh, the audience during the performance of Sun Ra. I mean, this is, I mean, and uh, I have some photographs of Sun Ra um, rehearsing and just looking at the faces of the people who were just surrounding you know, just norm, normal people in Festac Village who were witnessing that. So there was a sense of like <clears throat> wanting to, you know, I don't know where all the people came from because Festac Village itself was sort of like a protected zone. Um, Nigeria was a military state at that time. Um, and so we, and at this, uh, uh, the festival happened after uh, some tragedy in, um, the Olympics, I'm not sure what year it was, so we were being protected by you know, machine guns and all that kind of stuff. But we still had the presence, I, maybe about um, in, within Festac Village of, of workers and, and regular, you know, regular people. And in addition to, you know, we were also our own audience. Um, we, would, uh, we became audi informal audiences in Festac Village. But I witnessed um, during the time of the festival a large, you know, a lot of people excited about the performances. And I don't know, and so I don't know the flip side of that. I don't know if the tickets were pricey, were they free? Were, I don't know how um, the people got there because we were just so amazed that we even got there. I think that it's, um, it's a work we are doing together in France. I'm, just, I'm not alone in France. We have uh, Leonora Miano, Sami Chak, Abdurrahman Waberi. And even if when I wanted like to express the African literature in France, I make sure, I made sure to be surrounded by our greatest brains, including Suleiman Bashir Diagne, Asil Bembe, Dominique Thomas, and so on and so on. So we were like a group of people. We wanted to show that we need now and only now <coughs> to understand that uh, for a long time, uh, African writers or African um, creators didn't have the credit they deserve. So we recalled a lot of uh, things about history, 
For instance, in my first lesson, I did recall that the time of the literature when Africa were, was considered like uh, the land of darkness, I tried to express how we did suffer about the prejudices uh, just because we were black, just because we came from Africa. That was very important. And I saw that uh, French people didn't learn a lot about African literature. It was like they were discovering that in African literature, we were talking about us, but we were talking also about them. <laughs> that was like uh, the first time they were saying, what in African literature they're talking about? They read Montesquieu, they read Proust, and they are trying to reverse the situation. So the proudness of all the team, we were like, uh, for the colloquium, we're going to release it uh, February the 2nd, at the Edition du Seuil. We kept the same title, Penser et écrire l'Afrique aujourd'hui. So that's going to be released with texts from Bembe, uh, Suleiman, uh, uh, Pascal Blanchard, even Dani Laferrière. It was open like during in the 56 or 66, in which we gathered a lot of people coming from everywhere in order to express or to explain the issues of our world. It scared. France, maybe, that's why I say, well, what's going on here? I know that the first lesson, we were like uh, uh, 1,300 people in it. So just because they wanted to see what they're going to say about African literature, we don't know. And then they came like uh, saying that we don't know what's going to happen here. They took place. We have the minister of that, uh, the, someone sent by Francois Hollande, for, and they were there. So we we're just talking about how for centuries we've been like fooled by the discourse driven by uh, the um, French literature in which the African did, didn't speak, he didn't like uh, move, he was just a shadow be, behind the, the French uh, man, and he was just carrying the luggages of the <laughs> colonizer from bush to bush <laughs> in order to uh, like uh, fulfill his mission. So the audience maybe um, is great for everybody, it's not like uh, I was just trying to be selfish. I showed to the French people, look how looked our thinkers. So they saw for the first time maybe uh, Lucy Musita coming from uh, Zimbabwe. They saw um, La Ferrière, but at the same time, I didn't like say that, no, 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 it's just uh, for black people. No, you have Pascal Blanchard, you have also uh, uh, François Durper, or people, black people uh, born over there, like uh, Rokaya Diallo, he came over there, or that writer from Ivory Coast called Gauze, who came there and explained how Foucault was uh, like uh, no the Foucault's father and then Bart Bart's father was like gave the Ivory Coast to the French people. That was one of the the the, the moment in which like I, I saw all the journalists like uh, uh, say no no how come uh, so because they wrote a lot of stuff about Bart, but nobody like explained that uh, Bart was connected to the system and his grandfather was like a leader and he gave the Ivory Coast to the French people. And you can read that in the cemetery Père Lachaise. It's written somewhere there. So if the audience or the performance is for the sake of our knowledges, if it's for 
expressing how Africa is great, yes, we're going to keep on like moving forward until they won't make the distinction between French literature and Francophone literature, considering like Francophone literature is for people who write with accent, whereas the French literature is above. We don't need that. Literature is literature. Well, we've talked about the audience for uh, literature and the audience for film, mm -hmm. but I'm wondering, and I really don't know, what is the audience for uh, photographs of yeah. festivals? I mean, I, I don't know. I'm here now, but I don't know what the desire is out there to take in these images. So that's a question for the audience. <laughs> <laughs> the performance of Pan-Africanism through cinema. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking about, about that idea. And of course, I think one of the key factors is to do with how audiences engage with it. I mean, African cinema has achieved, a lot of films have achieved universal appeal. And how is it that they can talk to their local national audience and who find the... the the, the films of direct relation to their experience mm -hmm. and their lives. Mm -hmm. And somebody on the other side of the world, in mm -hmm. Israel, in Tokyo, etc. Mm -hmm. And that is the, the power of cinema mm -hmm. when it's at its best. And of course, African cinema can also achieve that. Mm -hmm. I think the performance of cinema has to do very much with its, its connection with, with audiences, and in terms of African cinema, it's what, um, what it communicates mm -hmm. in terms of an African um, experience or an African essence. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was going to be a bit flippant because there are very direct um, performance moments within African cinema, mm -hmm. again around language, because when um, films made in one part of Africa are going to another part of Africa. Mm -hmm. And subtitling won't work because there are issues of literacy. Mm -hmm. There's something called video jockeying. And you will pre play the film. And you will have somebody who will, um, who's able to read the, the subtitles. And they will have a microphone. And not only will they just tell you what is going on, they will add their own <laughs> spice to it. And they young, tend to be young people, and they do video jockeying. So the performance of African cinema is, wow. has, happens at so many different levels, especially when people want to engage, and you're trying to get this beyond literacy and beyond, and across the continent. I think that's, and of course, you know, the performance of African cinema. I take my mother to, to see certain films and she'll read the subtitles out loud. Or she will, you know, people <laughs> respond to characters mm -hmm. and they curse them and they, and that happens very, very, very much in African cinema. So I think there are a number of levels of that performance and I think all of them are particularly yeah. relevant. Thank you.